I'm going to go on this slide. So yeah, I'm going to prop you. I'm just going to get you. Um, anyway, as I said, I'm director of PCI services for IOActive. We're a, little, we're a boutique company uh, located in Seattle, Washington. We have offices literally all over the world at this point. Um, as I said, I've been doing PCI. I'm a trusted advisor for several Fortune 1000 companies. Um, and I do spend a considerable amount of my time doing everything from uh, compliance in the cloud, something that you just heard about, all the way through to just still simply doing PCI kind of related things. And then I'm a general all around nice guy, well, unless Chris is involved. All right. Uh, so, what do I want you to think about? So, PCI DSS, it remains relatively static. We see changes every couple of years. We saw the versions 1.1 to 1.2, but we see really clarifying changes occurring. Um, they realize things like they shouldn't call out Tripwire anymore, so they remove Tripwire. They shouldn't call out Microsoft anymore, so they remove Microsoft. So we th see things like that. But really, truthfully, it's the, it's the idea of main get, maintaining ongoing compliance. But it's costly. We know this. That's what I speak about on a regular basis. That's what CEO, or CTOs and CISOs are talking to me about. We need to try to adapt without introducing new problems. So we need proactive stance towards our threats and compliance. Okay, that's relatively self-explanatory. All right, come on. There we go. It's uh, quick, inexpensive changes don't increase their employee workload. This is actually more important during this time. During recession, uh, we've got less workers, right? It's harder to go and convince people to hire new staff and to actually implement, I sound like froggy. Um, it's harder to get staff in to help you. Um, so what we want is when we're making changes to our security infrastructure, we want it to be quick, we want it to be painless, and we want it to actually work right out the door. Well, we know that's not always the case. And then good security relies on understanding your business. External factors are often in direct conflict with good security. Now this is really where I spend 90% of my time, talking to the business people. Um, and that's what really my presentation will be about today, is talking about business has to understand that security is not IT. Business has to understand that security lives and breathes and has to be a business function. Without that being a business function, we're gonna run into dozens of problems. And that's what we're gonna talk about. So, what are we protecting? Okay. What is data worth to the bad guys? What is data worth to you? What does compliance cost? We'll talk about compliance and validation. Some of you already stole my slide. Wait, it's actually his slide. Um, does compliance actually make a difference? How do we get here again? And then I've got questions. Okay? So what are we protecting? Well, we all know we're protecting data. We no longer you know, what we sell on a daily basis is really truthfully our information. That's what we sell. That's what we're, we're exchanging is information. Whether it's our email, whether it is plans, whether it's new development ideas, that's what we protect these days. It's data. That's what is being sold is data. So that's what everything's around. But did you really think about the fact that we also are protecting our brand and reputation. Think about breaches. What does that do when we talk about, this thing's gonna fall off here. Um, what, what happened to TJ Maxx? What happened to the Hannaford Markets? What's happening to Heartland? They're all over the newspaper. That affects your brand. Potential financial liabilities. We'll actually talk about that because that's my key component. That's what I'm using now when I talk to businesses. We talk about litigation. Lawsuits. Lawyers love breaches. Then we talk about government intervention. The government starts getting in. And we know how well they do when they get involved. So, all right. Numbers to consider. This is a fun one. America, so this was a study. Oh, while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to prop. So most of my statistics come from Gartner, my favorite. That was Forrester. And then a lot of the work that I've done here is actually me pouring over uh, different companies' 10Qs and their 10Ks. A 10Q is their quarterly report, 10K is their yearly report. And actually pulling out the financial figures to do this. Um, simply because I found that statistics, like Hoff and I go round and round, statistics don't prove anything. We can bend statistics to show whatever point we want to show. So what I do is I sit down and read your financials and I pull out those things. And then knowing what I know about how much it costs to do certain things, then I can take apart your budget and say, ah, oh, this is what you really spent this year. So now that I've clarified that, 
So this was a study done by Gartner. So 81% of companies still out there today are storing their credit card numbers. Yeah, they're still electronically stored. Well, they, yeah, it's a combination of paper and um, electronically. Okay. But they're still storing credit card numbers. So PCI doesn't differentiate between paper storage and... No. Uh, actually, that's the better question. Yeah. That. So, okay. Yeah, PCI does. If you've got a receipt and you've got credit card information on it, you've got to protect it. I mean, Mike even commented on that. Piece of paper is the same thing as a credit card number electronically. And a lot of times, in fact, Mike was talking about that earlier, is a lot of times when you ask how they're protecting, nobody ever thinks to protect the paper. Um, I, I had a company recently that I was working with who, uh, the reverse transactions, and that's our, the, in PCI industry, reverse transactions is our favorite argument um, for those of us that deal with credit card data. Because um, my, the, your acquiring bank will, at the end of every month, the reverse transaction, they send you a letter in the mail that has the name the credit card number and the expiration date and then the transaction amount all in the clear on a piece of paper that they mail you every year every month at the end of the month and your job in a retail store is to go and match that transaction to the actual credit card receipt and then once you have that actual credit card receipt then you fax it back to your acquiring bank so let's see let's walk through that process so I get a letter in the mail that's got my credit card number in the clear I then walk over to my fax machine, I fax it out to a store, they go root through all the receipts, they find it and they fax it back to me, and then they fax it one more time. How many paper copies have I made of this stupid credit card number? I've made three copies of it. Okay, so I was working with this client, and they had three copies for every credit transaction they were trying to go through, all in paper. Now the two women who managed this process had boxes piled up around their cubes of the last three years of these reverse transactions. All in the clear, I could just flip through them and look at anybody who had done, you know, argued a transaction, read all their credit card detail. All there, plus they had the faxes stapled to them where we'd done the actual receipt. So now I had copies of their signatures. So everything's there. So they were evaluating this solution. It was a little over a $2 million solution to implement an optical scanner. So all of the retail locations, so 142 retail locations, we're gonna get this little optical PC. Uh, this, it was connected to an optical network. So when this letter came in from the bank, they placed this thing into the scanner, they'd scan it and it put blocks of text, or it'd block across the credit card numbers. And then they could send it out and you could scan back in, you could place blocks over everything. And now it's all completely protected. It's all PCI compliant. I can't read credit card numbers anymore. Two million dollars. I'm sitting there at the table looking at them. I start laughing. I said, I got an idea. I went running out to their supply cabinet. I grabbed a Sharpie and a thing of white out. I walked back inside. I whited out the, or I white, blacked out the credit card and I put white out across it. I held it up and I said, what do you guys think? Is this PCI compliant? A 50 cent solution for a two million dollar problem. The line item in their budget is called the Ward line item because I solved their problem for 50 cents. Okay, so security doesn't have to be expensive is really what I'm trying to point out here. But these are the kind of things that I deal with when I'm talking to C-levels. So we don't need to store credit card numbers. Store payment card expiration numbers. What happened June 1st of 2008? MasterCard said you now have to blank out all, on your store receipts, you need to blank out the, uh, the expiration date. Next time you use your MasterCard, look and see whether they're doing it. I still find about 50% of the companies are not doing it and they're still storing it. 71% store the CVV, CVV, the CVC. That's illegal, according to PCI. We're not supposed to do it. Yep, they're still doing it. 57 store the entire magnetic strip. What this means to me is, as a bad guy, I've got a 50% chance that the company I knock over is going to have a full magnetic strip for me to steal. And if I can get a full magnetic strip, I can do a lot of damage. 16% also store other data. So not only are they storing all my credit card information, you could be like Hanford, they were storing my credit card information, they were also storing because I was a member of their 
frequent shopper program, they had my name, they had my address, they had my phone number, they even had, in essence, what I like to buy at the grocery store. They could tell me what my favorite beer was. All stored, all related to my credit card information. That's pretty much all I need to perpetuate great ID theft. So what's your, what is your data really worth? So international hackers stole $9 million, $9 million from 130 ATMs in 49 cities. They did it in a period of 24 hours. 130 cards, they hit ATMs all over the world, walked away. Each card, in essence, value at $90,000 a card. Isn't that awesome? That's what I should be doing instead of standing here talking to you guys. I should be stealing credit cards. Four iWire payroll cards. You guys know what a payroll card is? These things are awesome because there's no limit. It's in essence tied to your bank account. So as long as your company's got cash, payroll card works. Four of them, 9,000 actual attempted withdrawals. Somebody's not looking at their books. That means that each card in essence was worth $1.2 million. Citibank, they won't actually give me statistics on this one. Cashier, or cashiers converged on New York and withdrew. This was another 24 hour period. $2 million from Citibank accounts. This is good money. And it's untraceable. And you don't need a gun. Huh? And you don't need a gun. Yeah, yeah. You're less likely to get shot at. And that really makes me happy. I don't like getting shot at. Okay, this is one of my favorite. This dude, his, his site is so professional. It's nice. He's got a web designer. I've scanned his site. He does a better job than most of the companies I work with is their ASV. And he'll sell me cards. I can buy USA Classic cards from $16 to $20 at 50 cards a pop. And he'll give me a better deal. He guarantees 95% validity rate. So that means out of my 50 cards, 45 of them are going to work properly for me. So it's not, it's, I don't even have to actually go out and figure out how to knock over a company. I can just buy them online. What's going on here? Okay, so what's your data worth to you? Well, this is what I'm trying to teach companies. Data is not just worth whatever we've decided, we've attributed to it. This is what goes into the cost of data. The development, how much did it cost to have my web app guy designed the web app front end that's taking in the credit card. To, how much does it cost to maintain that DBA who's rocking and keeping my, my database alive? How much does it cost to have my marketing people out there selling my company? How much does it cost to have operations constantly monitoring everything and keeping things alive? That's what the cost of my data is. Securities. How much does it cost for security to keep things alive here? Again. We don't talk about that. Companies don't look at that. They just say, how much is it going to cost me to put that firewall in place? How much is it going to cost to put, tr implement Tripwire? How much is Active Directory going to cost me? What is it going to cost? They don't actually look and understand that security requires everything. All right. So let's talk about what those real numbers are. So these are pulled from TJ Maxx's or TJX from their 10 Qs and their 10 Ks. So we'll just, we'll start off before we start looking up here. TJ Maxx in 2006 made $17.2 billion. In 2007 they made 15 point, uh, was it 15.6 million, or billion dollars. And in 2008 they made $17.2 billion. Billion, not million, billions of dollars. Okay, so now let's talk about this. So their average cost per record was $90 a record. Well, how did I come up with that number? Well, let's talk about that. So on average, if you're maintaining a database of 6 million credit cards, so that's a level one merchant, for remaining 6 million, it costs $6 a credit card for encryption. Now remember how we do things in the financial industry. That's not $6 right now that I have to pay every time I do this. It's $6 across it. Okay, so if I implemented it in 2000, by the time we get to 2010, it's probably like five cents a credit card. Because we're going to write it off, it's going to decrease in value, whatever. But if I was to start today, I'm going to go implement a database, this going to cost me $6 per credit card just for encryption in my database. 
Okay, so $90 a record, where did I come up with this? So I went and looked at their 10Ks for 2007, and I said, well, what did they do? They had to pay for breaches, they had to pay for compliancy things, they had to pay for these. And you call these out, they have to be reported on publicly traded companies. Now what's interesting is, if you're a company that's been breached, then these line items show up. If you're a company that's never been breached, you can literally get away with simple lines like security, compliance. But if you're a breach company, your shareholders want to know more. So you actually have to call out specific line items. So right now, the only numbers they get to play with are breach companies. So in 2007, $90 a record. How did I come up with $90 a record? Well, they wrote off a little over a billion dollars. Now remember, I said in 2006 they made 17 billion. In 2007, they made 15.6 billion. So they already lost a couple bill. We're talking billions. And then they wrote off another billion plus because of the breach. Now all we really hear about, you know, Visa points out that they paid Visa 25 million. 25 million is a drop for them. That's a store. An actual TJ Maxx store in a year should be bringing in about $25 million. That's bank. This, guy, this doesn't affect them. Now in 2008 though, look, $200 a record. They had to write off, they wrote off their entire profit from 2007 to 2008 in compliance and security costs. $200 a record. This year I expect that for 2009, I expect it'll be another $200 a record based on what, the way they're writing things off in their books. Total cost over 10 years is going to cost them $9 billion. $9 billion. That's what it's going to cost them for this breach. Now that's a number that I can talk to. That's a number I can sit down and show you hard numbers when I'm talking to a CISO, a CEO, and most specifically CFOs. Nine billion hertz. Okay? So average cost of a breach in 2007 was $197, 2008, $202. Now this is based on, if you pull, there's the IT breach, what is it? It's a great website, I can give it to you afterwards. They track every breach. Well, a SEC, well, if, uh, I, th th it's easier to go out and find all the breaches and then you can actually go pull the financial records from the SEC. Because the SEC requires that you maintain them. You also pay to have a subscription at Hoover's and Hoover's actually does a better job of putting everything together so that you can grab it. This is neat stuff to me. I love looking at these numbers. All right, so let's look some more. So what is the cost of your data really? Well, there's going to be, there's two costs of data, which is interesting. There's what the cost of data is on the outside and what there's the, the cost of data on the inside. Right now we're talking about what the cost of data is on the outside. This is what, what we, this number we just talked about. This is what it costs TJ Maxx on the outside. What's going to disturb you is when we talk about what it costs them on the inside. So a breach is a costly event for an organization. Well, we've just discovered that, 200 bucks a record. That's a single record. A row in your database, 200 bucks. Average total cost for a reporting company, more than $6.6 .6 million per breach. Well, when we're talking about TJ Maxx, psha, drop in the bucket. That's, that's, six, that's uh, what, three months. That's a quarterly check out of one store. It's up from 6.3 in 2007 and 4.7 in 2006. Well, well, that's interesting. We definitely see a trend. The breaches are going up. It's costing us more. It ranged from $613,000 to almost $32 million. Well, we know who the high ones are. We know the Hannafords, we know of the, uh, the TJ Maxx's. But there are companies out there that are still paying $613,000 a year for breaches. Yes, sir? you have a pie chart or something that describes what that cost entails? Wow. Great. I like when you leave me in. Let's talk about that. God. No, I didn't know that. Great minds. Okay. So let's talk about where that comes from. So this is total cost per record. So a company A, it's a low profile breach. So we're talking about that $613,000 company. It's non-regulated industry. So we're talking about, we're not talking about banks. We're not talking about anybody that's got real regulations around it. Okay, we're just, and remember, I live and breathe PCI. I mean, I'm director of PCI services. So I'm really driven to that direction. Okay, so discovery notification response. 
So this is your outside legal counsel, notification calls, call centers, and discounted product offers. It's $50 a record. Okay? Least uh, lost employee productivity. Employees diverted from other tasks. It's $20 a record. Okay? We go to opportunity costs. So this is customer churn and difficulty in getting new customers. $20. Now that's an interesting number. And then we, we see it goes up. But let's go back to TJ Maxx. How did TJ Maxx do? They, they made money, right? They went from 2007 to 2008. They made $2 billion more dollars. Why did that happen? There are enough people who were driving into this recession with big smiles on their face that they replaced the customer churn. Now why, then this is where I come back to, I expect their numbers to stay at $200 a record because they can't keep replacing their customers. If anything, record costs will probably go up for them. Because at some point, enough customers will be exposed and say, gosh, you know what? I'm not shopping there. I can't trust them with my data. That goes back to my brand and my reputation. So data is going to become more expensive for them on the external breach. All right? Regulatory fines. So we're talking about FTC, PCI, SOX. Well, if there's no regulated, there's no cost for me. Restitution. Civil courts, they get involved. Again, nothing for me. I'm a low-level breach. Additional security audit requirements. Again, $0. Other liabilities, credit card replacement costs, civil, penal, civil penal, penalties, ah, zero dollars. So about $90 for that record. All right, now let's go up to the high profile regulated industries. So now we're talking about PCI companies. We're talking about what I call out, FTC, Sarbanes-Oxley. All right, look at the difference. Well, it's still the same price. It still costs me the same price for my legal counsel. It's 50 bucks. It cost me a bit more for my employees. We're at $30. Customer churn, wow, it's $100. There's not enough customer. If I'm a high profile company, if I'm a Nike, if I'm a TJ Maxx, if I'm an Apple, how many of you read about iTunes this last week? Yeah, iTunes. You can buy for 20 bucks, you can buy a $200 iTunes card in China. You think that's going to hurt their brand? Yeah, it's going to hurt iTunes. Because people now start, they're going to start to question. So Mike's looking at me. So you can go in China and buy a $20 or for a $200 iTunes card for 20 bucks because they figured out the algorithm for generating the little, when you buy the cards in the grocery stores, the uh, 50, the, the, two, the $200 uh, iTunes credit cards. They figured out the algorithm they're using for generating the numbers and the, the pin code on the back of them. But isn't that like prepaid credit cards? Yeah. They're not live until it's actually authorized by the store? No, not with the iTunes. So it's live you just scratch, yeah, you scratch the number off the back. Yeah. But it kills the brand. People aren't going to trust iTunes. Well, what does that do to Apple? That's horrid. No, go ahead. Most of the stats are coming out that the majority of the customers are down a very small percentage of the customers that leave after a breach. And there's been some talk that, you know, people kind of have the mentality that if it happened to them now, it's not it's less likely to happen to them again because of all the press. So That's true. They, they gain and actually statistics show that after a breach, Choice Point's a great one. Choice Point went through and eliminated their entire staff. They cut heads everywhere. You and I were talking about Choice Point last night. Um, they slice people's heads off everywhere and w replace them. And Choice Point has better security today because of it. But they've also struggled. I mean, you go look at their balance sheets, you can see that they had to invest serious money in order to bring themselves back up to at least equivocal uh, brand reputation than what they were beforehand. What we're really care about, I don't care. You're right. I support that. I can show you the financial numbers to support that. What we're looking at on the other side is that breach cost them twice as much per record than it would have on the inside. It actually costs a couple hundred percent more for their records than it does on the inside if they'd done a good job on the, in the first place. So it, 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 that's to be expected. That's what I want to see. 
If you suffer a breach, you're going to do a better job. You, you'll hear me argue, for those of you who follow me on Twitter, you probably saw me going around and around this last week about HIPAA. HIPAA has no bite. Love it. I think it's a great thing. But I've literally, I've talked to doctors and said, how compliant are you? And the doctor says, as compliant as I'm going to be. What the hell's that? Compliant as I'm going to be. I'm validated. I got my little certificate. Okay? What I'm wanting you to do is lie. I want budget items. I want you to realize this affects your dollar. So I don't care. Get breached. Makes me happy. Gives me new statistics. Because you're going to fix things. And then the, all the business analysts are going to go, damn, that was dumb. We shouldn't have done that. We should have talked to that ward guy because he's got numbers. So that's really what my goal is. I don't care. Breach or no breach. Breach, you get better. The numbers show that. I also have numbers that show by not do by following compliancy checks, you actually will you'll have greater pre, you'll get uh, you've got less customer return, you've got uh, um, better performance out of your out of your company, and you actually make more money. So we'll talk about that. That's actually one of my last slides. Okay, so let's see uh, opportunity costs. We talked about the customer return. We talked about regulatory fines, about sixty dollars on average there. We talked about civil courts, about thirty dollars per record. Um, the security audit requirements is levied as part of the breach, about 10 bucks. Um, credit card replacement cost, civil penalties if specific fraud being traced the breach, $25. So now that average record is about $305. I talked to a company recently, I was sitting there with their, uh, their CISO and we were talking about the Heartland breach. And I said, I was sitting there looking at him and I stopped and I said, Heartland breach affected you, didn't it? And he goes, yeah. I go, how much did it cost you? And he goes, well, it cost us having to reissue one and a half million payment cards. I go, did all of them were compromised? He goes, Heartland can't tell me. He said, so we had to go out to our entire customer base and reissue every one of the cards. A payment card costs about $3 to reissue. They're not in the news. This company will never be, they won't be in the news because the breach doesn't directly affect them. It doesn't directly affect their customers as near as they can tell. They've been monitoring it. They don't have to notify their customers, but all their customers suddenly got an envelope in the mail last month with a new payment card in it. And sort of a, hey, we're sorry, there was a glitch in the system, and so we've just reissued everybody new cards kind of email or kind of mail. They don't have to tell you. It, nothing was breached according to their stuff. So they don't have to tell you at all. But suddenly people are going, huh, why did I get these new payment cards? So, interesting thing. All right. So, how much does compliance cost? So in 2007, just assessing the scope of PCI-related work on average cost about $125,000. Okay? Assessing the scope is the hardest thing I do as a QSA. I spend 90% of my time trying to help you figure out what your credit card flow is. Mike made the comment, where is your information? I made the comment, don't talk about your data. Where is the data? How does it get from the customer to your database, from your database to your acquiring bank? Every company I work with cannot tell me. I have one company, three years, we finally know every path of the data. Three years it's taken me to get them. Where I was teaching a class. That's the reason I was late getting the source. I was teaching a class for them on Wednesday. And we were, they were all smiling because they know where their data is now. Three years. All right, so meeting the requirements. So having us come in and validate, a QSA come in and validate it. On average for a level one merchant, $568,000. That includes all your remediation effort, putting new firewalls in place, making sure everything's configured, turning audit logging on. <sighs> audit logging. The, oh, I just hate it. That's, that's a constant argument with regards to the PCI. Well, why do I need to audit that? Why do I need to log it? Do you know how much data I have? I am really starting to sound like froggy. Um, 
<clears throat> they, uh, they, they argue nonstop about how much data it is. I don't care about all the other data. Tell me what's happening in the stream from the moment it comes from your customer to the moment it leaves for your acquiring bank. That's really when I want audited. You don't have to store gigs and gigs and gigs of data for some server that's sitting in the, uh, you know, in Timbuktu that gives, has an occasional email come through it. I don't care. So it's not, this is a silly argument with me. We're talking about logging. Okay, so <laughs> in 2008, <coughs> 2.7, million dollars. So compliance jumped from 700, uh, what, almost $800,000 to 2.7. Now, I disagree with this number. This is Gardner. And Gardner likes to inflate things on a 10 to 25% basis, as near as I can tell. You got a question for me? Do we know how many number one markets there are? Yes. Visa gives that number out. Visa. Uh, gives out that number at the third quarter of every year. They put a report out that says how many level ones there are compliant. It changes, so I'm not going to tell you what the numbers are because I haven't looked at the report this year. So, uh, or for 2008. Yeah, there's like, uh, Mike, what is it? 2,000 level ones? Uh, no, no. What is In the United States alone, there's uh, about 350, 375 level one merchants. There's uh, about uh, two to five thousand. Level. Let's say three to five thousand level two merchants. Um, level three expands into the several thousand. And then the level four is four point eight million level four. So yeah. the pyramid goes like this: a couple hundred at the top, move down to a couple thousand, and then like a massive. Bottom. Yeah. And we'll we'll talk about. There's some neat numbers. We'll, we'll move through into level three merchants. Okay, so. A level one merchant's going to expect to spend last year 2.7. Okay, I didn't get that 2.7. I know what I charge. That's a, that's a bad number on Gartner's part. That's Gartner inflating. The average, when I went back and started pulling what I know and calling my friends in the industry what they were charging, the average is more like uh, a little over a million for 2008. It's like 1.2, I think, is what we worked it out to be. Okay, but that's still, that's a $400,000 increase from 2007 to 2008. Well, you go, well, how'd that happen? Well, there's no great increase from level twos to level ones from 2007 to 2008, but there was a change. Does anybody know what the change was other than Mike? Huh? Absolutely. No. We started talking about brick and mortar companies. Huh? Huh? One more. Yeah, no, no, not compromise. No, we just added to the number of companies we were looking at, brick and mortar. Because we used to, really truthfully, if everybody paid attention to PCI, it used to be really we were looking at e-commerce companies. That's not the case. We look at everything. But we started to see all the brick and mortars got drug into it. The yeah. Visa woke up and said, oh, yeah, we've got to start sending letters out to these companies. That's really where the number change came from. Because, and that, that it, lends some credence to what, uh, what Gardner puts up there in terms of 2.7, because now we got this huge number of brick and mortar companies we're looking at, and the brick and mortar companies have not been paying attention to PCI, because the typical response is, what are you talking about? I didn't get any letter from my bank. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have to be compliant. So that's the reason I said I came from about the 1.2 to 2.7. That's a million dollar window in there. But when we started looking at the figures, it started leaning a little bit more towards Gartner because we suddenly realized there was the rush of level twos and uh, the brick and mortar companies. Okay, level twos. So just, to start, just determining scope was a little over $105,000, excuse me, $105,000. And then to achieve compliance, validation, $267,000. So what, about $370,000, $375,000. 2008, $1.1 million. Again, now remember what I just said about the rush of merchants, the new. So that's that number, accurate. Level threes, $44,000, $81,155 on average. Not a huge number of growth there, really, truthfully. We went from what, uh, $120,000 to $155,000 about a $30,000 increase, okay? 
but don't forget quarterly scans. I had a customer tell me the other day that quarterly scans was a racket for the ASVs. And I said, it's not a racket because Qualys. I said, Qualys uh, is made at $3 an IP address. That's what the license costs, right? $5 if you don't negotiate well with Qualys. Well, it's not really a racket. You know what we're paying for an address. So if you don't get the value out of it, why'd you use this in the first place? All right. So how much does compliance really cost or validation? Level one merchants, a buck 15 per card at six million dollars, at six million cards. How did I figure that out? Well, I went back and I said, how much did it cost to get compliant, get validated, get my certificate? Versus how many cards I'm keeping? A buck 15. How much does it cost me if I, if I lose that card on the internet? $200. $200 what was it? Two hundred and two dollars. Some of them are PSAC compliant and still pay additional. Yeah. So. I'm saying compliance doesn't matter. I don't care whether you're combined. What I'm saying is you can spend the money. And it's going to cost you about a hundred a dollar fifteen per card at six million cards. Or you cannot work towards sort of what compliance asks you to be, is to work towards better security, and it's going to cost you $200 per card. So which, which do you think TJ Maxx would have preferred? Now TJ Maxx was valid at time of breach, but they didn't reoccur and keep that security good. They didn't maintain compliance. They were valid did not maintain compliance. Yes, sir? Um, the teacher's going to hit me here. No, I'm, I'm just curious. Level, you should understand how you break down, right? Level one is going to be anyone who's processing over 6 million transactions a year. Level two is processing between 1 and 6 million transactions a year across any acceptance channel. Level three is broken down to anyone that's processing 20,000 to a million transactions in commerce. So what, I guess what I'm curious is, do you see the number of level three merchants that are Costs going down as they outsource. Yeah, that's what I'm okay. yeah, going exactly there. <laughs> so we, we look at this and we say, okay, buck fifteen versus the two hundred dollars on the breach. We talk about a buck, uh, what was it, nine it's buck thirty seven per card on the level twos versus I think I said one ninety on the breach. Seven dollars and twenty five cents per card is a level three merchant. Remember when we were just talking about the numbers of level three merchants? Huge. Huge. They're paying seven bucks a card to maintain compliance around that, or validated compliance at a given point around that card. The hell, who let those, that, that business plan flow? You get kicked out of Harvard for nonsense like that. And they're still doing it. But that's a hard number. That's a number to sit down with your executive and go, why the hell are we saving these credit card numbers? Seven bucks. That's what it's costing me. And encryption is more expensive. That's partly, you know, we've got encryption here. Because remember I said it's six million cards. It's six dollars a card to maintain that encryption around it. It gets more expensive than the less numbers. Least expensive the higher. Yes, sir. PCI doesn't care. PCI does not care. You're acquiring banks do not care. The only time you're acquiring bank will care, and I've asked this because that's one of my pet peeves in the PCI world. I have asked the acquiring banks, why the hell do you allow them to do this? And they're like, we make more money. I go, so it doesn't really matter to you? And they go, no. I said, well, when is it going to matter to you? They go, they suffer a breach. You suffer a breach, you don't get to play anymore. We, we consolidate all your numbers. So have 150 level four and have a breach on one level four, do they all go They're going to wrap them all together. Wrap them all together as an aggregate? Or as an aggregate. Do do well, if you've got 154 and they're all doing, what, a level four is uh, 20,000 cards, so 
whatever it kicks them up to, whatever level. Actually, you suffer a breach, you're going to get kicked all the way up to level one. Yeah. For all, they're going to wrap you all together. Yeah, I can't tell you what level fours are doing. The answer is yes. So people that try to separate out their, their payment streams are all well. It, all it does is, uh, you know, it's like, it, it's like saying, if I decide to drive down the freeway at 75 miles an hour and close my eyes, will I not get hit? But I won't see it coming, will I? It seems to be a, a, a widespread tactic. It is. I, you're, I have several, several clients. And that, hence the reason it's a pet peeve of mine. In Europe, you can't get away with it. In Europe, the banks talk. They don't let you play that game. In the US, it, we consider it competitive advantage. We do. That's the rule. That's what I sat with the banks and argued. I went, Call, you're kidding me, really? And they're like, yep, sorry. Across the table, he's like, I don't care. He goes, until they suffer a breach. He said, then I'm wrapping them up. It was even funny, you're talking about that. I have one who uses the same bank for all three processing. So the bank knows that they've got three different DBA numbers in order to keep themselves as level twos so that they can perform their sacks every year and turn them in. He knows that they're doing it. He didn't care. All right. So, now does it make business sense to store credit card information? I think we just looked at the numbers. Why are we storing them? Mike made that comment. Reverse transactions, the typical argument. You cannot give me a valid argument as to why you should ever store credit card information. I started the company six months ago helping them. They were like, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, no, you don't. They said, well, how do we do this? We've got reoccurring payments. I said, what happens with your reoccurring payments? They go, well, every 30 days we have to recharge them for this. I said, well, why don't we do this? On the 28th day, let's re-off that card. They go, what do you mean? I go, well, you get an authorization card, right? And they go, yeah. I go, oh, re-auth it for a dollar. That proves that the card's still good, and it pins the card. And they go, well, yeah. I go, there you go. Card's re -auth. All, you know, well, we don't have to keep the credit card number. We got the authorization code every 28th day. So on the 28th day, they re -auth the card for a dollar, then they recredit you a dollar. The card's still live in the system because they have an authorization number. A transaction number lets them keep track in their books. And they don't have to maintain the credit card number. Credit card number comes in once, goes into the batch, boom, done, never stored again. Yes, sir? In order to authorize the card, don't you need to pan the expiration date? No, you do not. Once you have the, the first time to, to initiate the authorization transaction, you have to have the pan and the expiration. After you've authorized it, you can use authorization code for up to 30 days. With that acquire? Yeah, with that acquire. Gotcha. At 30 days, it times out. So on the 28th day, you can re-auth without having the card. But it's specific to certain acquirers. Uh, yeah, you have to go to your acquirer. But uh, I haven't met a acquirer actually yet that doesn't do it. We can talk, but all the big acquirers are, are accepting it. Because the acquirers are starting to come around. They're starting to understand. Their, cu their, their customers are saying, sorry, we don't want to store credit card data anymore. So they're coming around. All right. So what's the reality of PCI? Well, it's required. The pain of non-compliance is obviously worse if you ignore the problem. And then PCI uh, compliance can be maintained with a comprehensive information security program. Right? It's part of the business. Compliance. He already stole the thunder on this one. So versus security versus validation. In, in the words of my teacher, compliance, even the continuous state of compliance, does not equal security if not done right. Validation is but a brief point in time, and we got a rock in our certificate of valid validation shut her down. 
No, that's not the case. What I'm asking, what I'm showing and demonstrating is that a record costs this much. We know how much it costs. We know that there's a business cycle associated with it. It's now part of the business. We need to maintain it. It has to be a budget line item. We can't just say firewalls are good. We, we'll go buy new firewalls and we'll make it. So, principles. Does it need to be stored? Again, Mike taking all the thunder. Never will I follow Mike again. Don't store it. Don't ever assume that your information is safe. Making that assumption that it's safe will get you in trouble. Who are, who are you exchanging your data with? How are you exchanging it? Um, where, is, where is your data sleeping tonight? Check it and check it again. And then finally, do we really need to store this? Again, go back and ask yourself, why the hell am I storing this? I've, I've given you business models that say there's no reason. It costs me too much. So why are we storing it? All right. So how do I save some money? So understanding your scope, going back and understanding that flow of information, knowing the shop around, knowing that based on the numbers I was showing you, there are obviously cheaper places to go. Think outside the box. I gave you an example of that, going using my Sharpies and my whiteout. Improve your security policies, some really bad code there. Better business understanding, regular PCI awareness, and then make PCI and data compliance a priority. I've given you the tools. I've shown you that it, it can be done, that there's money there. Party advice, new technologies are always going to equal new security threats. It's a guarantee. We don't know what we don't know. Cloud, right? We know that there are going to be new vectors associated with the cloud. We've got our frogs and we've got our meat, all right? There's stuff coming. <laughs> Traditional threats change constantly. Vendor experience does count. Think about the companies you're working with. You know, why do they change their names? Think about that one sometime. Uh, PCI is more than a retail outward network. Ensure security at all access points. Um, PCI compliance is more than a cost center. All right? So, does compliance make a difference? Now, this is IT policy. This wasn't me. But some neat numbers. 17% higher revenue. So they sampled 5,000 companies that were maintaining, had not suffered a breach in 10 years, um, and maintained compliance with regards to both. This does include SOX and uh, um, some of the banking require and PCI. 14% higher pr profits, 18% higher customer satisfaction rates, 17% higher customer retention values, 96% reduction in uh, and loss from customer data theft. Well, if you're maintaining compliance, you can be validated that you're maintaining compliance. You've got programs in place that make sense that you're going to see a reduce and a 50% 50, 50 reduction in data breaches and related losses, 50% less spent on compliance annually. By making it a program and by implementing it as part of your life cycle, you're less likely to uh, you're, you're not going to spend as much. I mean, that's what, that's what we're doing here. All right. So what do you walk away with? Always start with uh, security. Compliance isn't for breakfast anymore. OK? It's not just the point, I, you know, the validation thing. Um, understand the value of what you're protecting. Know how much. Uh, I'm working on some form. What, what I, I couldn't do today is I want to build sort of the financial model that a company can take inside. Because as I said, the numbers I can work with right now are only the numbers that are publicly exposed. Well, companies aren't going to give me their numbers. So what I want to do is create the formula for you to take internally to your company and plug it in and you say, wow, my data is worth $2.75 a record. If I'm breached as a level one, it's worth $190 a record. Heh. And being able to show those things to your, your executives. Um, Implementing security doesn't have to be expensive or hard, and there isn't always a business reason for keeping the data. All right? So, questions. Did you know I sort of look and sound like Al Gore? That's what I've been told once or twice. Yes. yes. 
Um, no, I had nothing to do with building the internet. Uh, do you believe that Christopher Hoff just enjoys hearing the sound of his own voice? <laughs> um, uh, yes. And do you think we still have time to get a beer before we leave for the airport? Yes. All right. Thank you guys very much for your time today. Questions? Other questions? Yeah, get rid of your data. Yeah. Yeah. And lawyers like that too. I mean, because you do deal with legal counsel on a regular basis. So getting rid of your data gives liability. He does, he, he, uh, Mike says he doesn't like using that liability thing. I don't care. I got lawyers. So get rid of it. Give it to somebody else. Let somebody else assume it. I mean, that's the whole reason PCI was created. They wanted to move the liability down the line. Questions? Any other? Bueller? Yes. Oh, okay. Good, bad, indifference. Did you guys learn anything? Good. I like to see. I think I like to see the more requests. I like to see the those better numbers juxtaposed. Uh huh. Because you kept referencing back to them, but I couldn't. Yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah, very good. Uh, because it's very good because the question to see, so I would assume would ask was, okay, yeah, I want to stay at the dollar yeah. number, whatever. How do I do that? What do I invest in to make sure that we Makes sense. maintain the plan? Okay. I would like that would be cool to think All right. Cool. Anything else? Any other comments? I, negative's good. I, I learned from it. Makes my presentations better. Negative. No, that wasn't. It's reported that 72% um, of statistics presentations are made up. Are made up, yeah. I, and that's, I, I hate statistics too for that very reason. That's the reason I like to read 10Ks and 10Qs. Uh, nothing better to do on Friday night. Because uh -huh. there, there are no lies Sad in those. Because huh? there are no lies in those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the best I can get, right? It's the hardest numbers I can get. I just wonder what kind of reception you get when you choose to show these kinds of numbers in various companies. I've not spent a lot of time in the quantitative modeling, and I just get the cost of this. I find that most of the models Right. So 30% of it is based around opportunity costs, right. Again, that's when I go back and I, I live, yeah, I live and breathe with the 10 Qs and the 10 Ks because that is, we have to, we have to pick something that we're going to believe is solid. SEC has told us they have to be accurate to a certain degree. Uh, Sarbanes Oxley has said they have to be accurate to a certain degree. So by using those hard numbers. And by having real budget line items that say, this is what I spent. Does that opportunity cost in there, is it self-reported on their part? In some cases it is. In some cases you're just going to have to infer it. Um, the numbers are, 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 in, are deep enough that in most cases you don't even have to infer it. That you can say, well, look, they called it right here. <sighs> you know, like with TJ Maxx. I mean, TJ Maxx says, breach, $1.7 billion. Well, and, they, and I mean, there is a degree of that. Yeah. Well, that's the reason. So the 10K will say breach $1.7 billion, whatever it is. And then if you look at the quarterlies, the quarterlies, they break it out. They have to because that's a requirement of reporting in your 10Q. You could say, I mean, you could scoop it off. Yeah, you can change. I mean, yeah, you can mess around with what you're reporting it as. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I'm real more interested in terms of the number I'm specifically talking. You, the numbers you're asking for actually will come out of that. I'll have to go back and I'll start to look at that. But what I'm more intrigued with is breach cost 1.8 billion. 
because you are, I mean, I consider as part of a breach, you have to fix that. So yeah, I expect that DLP and new firewalls and new reporting and everything else are part of the breach cost. So, cool. All right, thank you guys very much. Yeah. No, Bernie, Bernie ran a great Ponzi scheme. That's what he did. Oh, okay. Here, let me give you one more. I spent a lot of time doing security metrics. Oh, okay. With Jake, with the gear, and so forth. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, it's uh, it's recently become sort of a, because I sp I, I spend so much.